for those of you that are not from Israel, you have to understand that when, when, uh, when Rami and Yoram were talking about the rivalry between Sayeret Matkal and Yamam, the analog, I mean, this is really part of the Israeli culture and ethos. And it's very sort of uh, playful uh, debate over whose unit is a better unit. Not that dissimilar to uh, what you have here in the United States, where people arguing over their, their baseball teams or their basketball teams. The Celtics or the Lakers are better. So in Israel, we have more of an affinity towards our units. But I do think that um, what we're seeing emerging in Israel, and this is really the first time, is not a debate over whose unit is better, and not even a debate over whose sports team is better, but we're beginning to get to the point in our existence where we're getting into a debate over ideas, real ideas, uh, ideas that are sort of taken for granted here in the United States, but they're not taken for granted in Israel. We haven't had real substantive uh, quality debate on what is really conservative thought, what is really liberal thought, and, and Amiyad and Tikva and Herut are bringing us towards that, and so I personally, you know, you don't have these ideas and these sort of debates in the marketplace of ideas where everyone's talking just to themselves. So I want to personally thank Rami for coming. I think it's very, very important that, that, that you came. And even if many of us don't necessarily agree with much of what you said, I think the fact that you're willing to come here and debate on the sort of in the battlefield of ideas. I, I disagree with everyone you don't agree with. <laughs> One of the amazing things about Israel is it's, it's, it's astonishing that everyone knows everything about everything. It's amazing. <laughs> um, anyway, so thanks very much for coming and, and uh, really appreciate it. So I actually think maybe the simultaneous translation broke when someone said conceptia because it's, you know, is it English, is it Hebrew? God, he's talking about it. It's, it's, it's not English, it's not Hebrew. I will say that sort of the... Uh, the way I translate conceptia into English is mindset, right? When Israelis say conceptia, they're referring to mindsets. And, <laughs> and there's, there's many sort of different conceptio that were discussed and referred to since October 7th. I'm going to, in the you know, few minutes I have, uh, talk about one, which I think is sort of a fundamental flaw and was the beginning of the path that led to October 7th. It started, it's hard to pinpoint an exact date, but it started sometime in around 2014, 2013. And that was the moment when Israeli citizens living in urban areas became legitimate targets. Now I want you to think about that. Since 1948, no war took place in Israel, in Israeli territory, in urban areas where civilians lived. It was not acceptable. And, you know, Yom Kippur, it wasn't in urban areas, and we quickly took the fight to them. Rockets were fired at us in Haifa in 2006, Second Lebanon War. We immediately went to Lebanon. At some point in the first half of the previous decade, for reasons we might go into during the panel, Israelis living in primarily southern towns became legitimate targets. A normal person with a healthy mind, if a rocket is fired at your house in Rockville or Silver Spring, you don't say, OK, well, we're, we're going to. You take the fight immediately to the enemy. That's a normal human instinct. It would be astonishing to think otherwise. For reasons we can get at, for reasons I don't have time for now, we decided not to. And the sort of Netanyahu doctrine became very different. It was like, no, no, we can absorb rockets being fired at our citizens in our urban areas because we have four things that protect us. The first thing, and this is all conceptia in my view, it's an important concept. First thing is we have technological superiority. We have Iron Dome. So you can fire all the rockets you want in us, but I'm going to pick them off in the air. Imagine if your kid was going to school and there was a bully who, who, who would uh, steal his lunch money or try to beat him up. And you told your kid, no, it's no, it's no problem. You're wearing, a, you're wearing a powerful vest. 
When he punches you, it won't, it won't hurt. It won't, it won't hurt you. You won't feel it. I can't imagine any parent would say that to his kid. He would say, if there's a bully beating you up, you have to beat him back. And harder. Create deterrence. That wasn't the Netanyahu way. We were like, no, we've got, we can pick them off with, with rockets, with Iron Dome. We celebrated Iron Dome. The second part of the national security policy, and you'll soon see why I call it a policy and not a strategy. Israelis aren't good at strategy. The second part of the policy was we're going to build a wall. I know many people in the United States think a wall is a panacea. It's not. Rami said that, uh, you know, that God is in this room. So for those of us that are people of faith, there's a verse in the Bible. In Numbers, when Moses sends the spies to go see the land, the question he asks, are they, do they live in walled cities or are they in open areas? Right? And uh, I'll make up the time for you. Um, with the obvious, the obvious sort of uh, implication being by all the rabbinic sources that people that lived in walled towns are weak. They feel they need the wall. Therefore, they're going to be easy prey. People that don't have walls surrounded by them, they don't live in fear. That's what the spies in the Bible wanted to know. Are these cowards who build walls around their cities? Or are these courageous fighters who don't need walls? We went with Iron Dome, we went with a wall, and the wall wasn't enough for us. Again, the war can take place, Israelis in Israel can be legitimate targets because we've got, on top of the walls, we've got more fortification. Right, in Hebrew it was, we're gonna have regulations that every home is gonna have a special room which can be protected from, it wasn't that, the thinking wasn't, if anyone dares to fire rockets at us, we're gonna make sure they never do it again. It was, no, no, we're gonna build more sort of fortifications inside, so we'll, we'll, we'll protect ourselves. Take a step back from the concepcia and think, is that a sign of strength or a sign of weakness? This was the approach. And finally, the last thing, and I'm not gonna go into, I'm gonna cut myself short here, but the last sort of piece to this national strategic defense policy was, you know, we've got great logistics capabilities. So if things get really dire, we can just move people from the north to the south, from the south to the north. It used to be unthinkable. Part of the Israeli ethos, you never abandoned a settlement. Never. Never. Since Tel Chai, it wasn't done. There's, there's great battles and lore, the battles in Gush Etzion, the battles here, the settle, I mean, women and children were evacuated maybe, and the fighters stayed back, and they fought. And there's heroic stories about this. Something happened in the early two, in, in 2011, 12, 13. We said, no, 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 we've got great logistics capabilities. And we're 160 days into this war. I think there's still 150, 200,000 uh, people. In Hebrew, they don't call them refugees because, because it's, uh, it's self-imposed and it's embarrassing, but it's the truth. And it's part of the logic, it's part of the conception, it's part of the strategy. So if you think about what's, Dramatic, a dramatic thing is that Israeli citizens, legitimate targets in their hometowns because we have Iron Dome, because we have walls, because we have fortification, and we can evacuate people if we need to. That's not a healthy approach. And anybody that's invested in any cybersecurity company, I'm going to stop now, anybody that's invested in any cybersecurity company knows that you can have the best defense, eventually they're breached. Eventually, every defense gets breached, whether it's a wall, whether it's cyber. And then the question is, how tough are you? How strong are you really? How much conviction do you have? And how much courage do you have? And how much backbone do you have? And for a range of reasons, Israel stopped being the Israel it used to be around 2012, 2013, 2014, and started thinking about other approaches to protecting Israelis. Um, I have a lot more to say on that, but I'm over time, so I'm gonna... In any organization in the world, 
And this is why we have to stop blaming generals and blaming whatever. I know it's not popular in certain fronts. People that advance far in the organization adopt the culture of the organization. It's true in corporate America, and it's true in the police force, and it's true in the army, okay? If you want to go far in Google, you're going to have to adopt certain views on DEI and whatnot, because otherwise you won't advance. And the same is true in universities, and the same is true in the Israeli army. Every institution has its culture. I don't blame anyone who's figured out how to navigate those organizations for adopting the culture and the mindset if you've been there for decades, literally decades. People are humans. What's the way to deal with that? If we acknowledge that that's inevitable and that people that are gonna go far, and for the purposes of our issue, it's, it's the military, how do we deal with that? Mayor, one idea I have is that I think the National Security Council in Israel I think all sort of people with military backgrounds should be banished, right? There's a real um, importance in having a challenge process, right? And having people that think differently. We talked all the time about how, how come people don't think differently, et cetera. There are certain organizations that don't welcome challenge, right? It's very rare to have an organization that, that thrives and relishes on, on genuine challenge. Uh, the Israeli military leadership is not one of those organizations. Therefore, how do we deal with that? And the only way is to have a, a counterparty that does challenge them. You know, when I was director general of the prime minister's office, so a friend of mine was national security advisor for, for, um, for Steny Hoyer here. And he used to, he used to accommodate him, and uh, he happened to be a childhood friend of mine, and he went to Harvard, and he went to Stanford, and he, you know, he never served a day in the army, but he was, he studied national security policy from a real perspective. And whenever he would come in, I would take the entire prime minister's staff and I would say, I want everyone to see what a national security advisor looks like in a civilized country. Because in the Malal, in the Israeli Malal, it's okay, any, any general that wasn't able to get promoted, they, and he ran logistics in some, you know, uh, some Ugda somewhere, they throw him and all of a sudden he's a national security guy. That's unacceptable. I know, I'm sorry, but, 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 but I know, I know Nimrod, I'm curious what Nimrod and, and, and Mary think about this, but that is unacceptable. We need to not blame people for adopting the culture of the organizations they advance in. We need to figure out ways to make sure there's challenge for those people while acknowledging that they're going to be human and they're going to adopt the culture and the mindset of organizations that they're in for decades at a time. There, there's, a, there's a small snippet of Tamir Heyman, who is a former head of uh, army intelligence, which in Israel is also the national director of intelligence. And, he's in, and this is a, about a month before October 7, and he said, people are calling me hysterically and saying that Hamas is going to attack. And I tell them, relax. I don't even have to study the intelligence to know that they are not, because I know what their interests are. And their interests are to keep their people um, uh, 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 fed and to, and, and to take care of the daily worries of the Palestinians in, in Gaza. We, th these, these people were, were so sure of their conception that they that they did not think that they have to look at the intelligence data. So, so is that, Eli, is that not, in, in the end, a, 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 a professional corruption, a, a, a sort of arrogance that you can't have an intelligence? There's no question. There's no question. This was a massive failing, both on the parts of military intelligence, which let their personal ideology override it, override the reality, right? There was a report that came out by the head of military intelligence that climate change is a bigger threat to, to, to Israel than the Hamas. I'm not making this up. I, I'm not making this up. And um, everyone, in the, you know, when, when the head of intelligence says something like that, it's not a report. Anyone that's been in a big organization knows that when that's, a, all of a sudden you have junior officers across the military, that, you know, hundreds of them literally, coming up with reports, incorporating that into their sort of strategy for their units. It's, it's a horrible thing. So clearly, um, this was a massive, massive intelligence failure. But focusing on that takes away from the equally massive political failure. This was 
a uh, horrifying lack of leadership, um, a focus on sort of, there was literally a strategy to, you know, the Hamas was effectively a partner, a quasi-partner, not a partner, a quasi-partner. And, um, you know. So, so maybe you can define for the audience this conception. What was the idea? Yeah, it's not partnership, I think, is an exaggerated. I said quasi-partner. But, but we talk about the Qatari money. So what exactly, how would you define the mistake? Where is the, where is the failure? The, the, the failure is the thinking that we were, someone said earlier this morning, managing a process instead of, instead of dictating what the process is going to be, right? The major, the, the, the inability of the Israeli government since 2014 to deal with Gaza which everyone knew was a ticking time bomb. I remember when I was director general of the prime minister's office, one of your colleagues in the Malal came over to me and they said, we need to make it palatable for, 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 for Gazans. Can we figure out a way to, to, like incorp to, to import food from Gaza? I sat with one of your former colleagues. I was like, you think Israelis are gonna eat pasta from Gaza? That's, that's not happening. That's not happening. Mm. But, I but, I was, Almost. Right, but, but, but I was sort of dismissed as the Oh, he, he, he doesn't know, right? We know. We know. So the sort of unwillingness to, to listen to other ideas is a major, major uh, flaw in both the military leadership and the political leadership, because they all know better. But, and here I'm going to challenge you a little bit, Nimrod. It can't just be forcing them to give you the data and the intelligence. Things don't work by force, right? That trust needs to be earned. And the dynamic between the Army and the National Security Council is such that from the Army's perspective, they look at people in the National Security Council or people that didn't advance far enough in the Army, so they go to the National Security Council. If it, if it would be a real sort of completely different group, 90% civilians, um, ac people who aren't intimidated by the generals and who the generals and, and won't be fooled by the generals, only then can you have sort of a real ibcha uh, mistabra, as they say in the, in the, in the world of, of Israeli intelligence. Yeah, but, the, the, but, but in Israel, the, the arrogance of the army is such that it has, or at least in, in, in recent times, it seems that they, they, they are comfortable compartmentalizing the politicians because they run, I think because the politicians are wild and, and can't be trusted. Gadi, I think since October 7th, many people in the military have been humbled. I don't know whether you're, uh, you agree with that or not. Uh, they take their indications from above. Yes, and there's a lot of tension between them and the political leadership. The political leadership you know, refuses to take responsibility, refuses to take blame. It's, 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 a, it's embarrassing, it's humiliating from, from an Israeli perspective, but, but uh, I don't expect the military leadership to behave any differently than the political leadership. I know that that's what will happen because there will be key um, military leadership that will finish this war and leave. Uh, even though Rami said they should wait till Netanyahu leaves, they'll leave before him. They have more sort of um, sense of responsibility. And the political leadership is gonna need to be voted out. There was and continues to be, in my opinion, an elephant in the room here. Israel's failure, which Ellie depicted quite emphatically, was built upon her success. Israel is a rich country today, a prosperous country today, with millions of middle-class people whose aspirations are no different than the aspirations of middle-class people in other Western countries. And the conception worked until it failed. I mean, how do you bridge uh, the natural inclination of people who have opportunities to avoid cataclysm uh, without confronting the, uh, uh, the evils of 10-7 of, uh, and Hamas? How do you keep vigilant during a time of great prosperity? Uh, that's, I don't expect citizens to have that vigilance. I do expect the military and I do expect the political leadership to have that vigilance. That's their job. They're the ones that are supposed to watch out for the citizens and there's no problem with citizens pursuing uh, freedom, happiness, etc. 
Um, so I, 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 I'm, I'm not I'm, I, uh, that's a question that should be directed at people who are responsible for, for, for protecting Israelis, and instead they, they, they failed. Regarding, you said something about sort of generation education. I want to say one thing that sort of addresses both of what you said, or what, what you asked, or comments. What happened October 7th for, the gen, for, for our children's generation is transformative in a way that's going to shape that entire generation. I want to be very clear. My kid's generation is going to be very different than my generation. Also five kids, right? Uh, and three are in, 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 in the military. And they're going to be changed forever where they, whether they want it or not. This is going to be a generation that is less materialistic, that more resembles earlier generations of Israelis. They don't have a choice. And they've been sort of melded by the experience of October 7th and the aftermath in ways that's going to shape that generation. The same way we talk about the, and again, it'll be for different reasons, but there was the generation of the Depression. There was the generation, the first generation of immigrants. There was the great generation in the 50s. What's going to happen for Israelis who came of age in the fall of 2023 is going to impact them forever in all the fields, and it will stay that way for at least the next 20, 30 years.